good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this web seminar. Um, this is a joint initiative of the Interinstitutional PhD program in political economy, the Portuguese Association uh, for Political Economy, and uh, the Department of Political Economy at uh, ISCTE, Lisbon University Institute. Uh, we are very glad to have with us today Engelbert Stockhammer, who is a professor of international political economy at King's College London and uh, he's a very active and prolific uh, post-Keynesian uh, economist. Um, Engelbert did his uh, PhD in economics at the University of Massachusetts at Armist. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, uh, this is one of the most well-known heterodox uh, PhD programs in economics uh, in the world. Um, actually, it's a PhD program where a few young members of the, the Portuguese Association for Political Economy are, are now studying. Maybe some of, of them are here with us. Uh, and it might be the case that they, ch they have ch chosen this program uh, in part influenced by Engelbert's uh, academic trajectory, since many of them know quite well um, Engelbert's uh, work. Uh, his work uh, has been uh, on several issues, such as the relationship between economic growth and income distribution, uh, fi uh, financialization and crisis, economic policy in the Eurozone, uh, post-Keynesian theory, uh, among others. Um, Engelbert, it is uh, an honor and a pleasure to, to have you with us today, even if at a uh, uh, prophylactic distance, uh, but we hope that sooner than later you will come to Portugal to, to continue this dialogue in presence. Um, uh, Professor Stockhammer will uh, make an initial intervention, and then we will have some time for, for discussion. Uh, those of you who are uh, participating uh, via Zoom can just click the raise hand button uh, when you want to, to talk. Uh, those of you following us on YouTube uh, can leave your comments or uh, questions on chat, and I will pass them uh, to our guests. Uh, so without further ado, uh, you have the cyber floor in this case, Engelbert, and thank you once more for, for being with us today. Well, thanks again, uh, Ricardo, for that nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, even if I'm actually not uh, there, but I'm in London. But such are the miracles of modern technology. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm delighted uh, that uh, in Portugal, there's such lively activities on political economy. And I shall be talking about a recent paper of mine. And if I manage technology, you will be able to see my slides. Yes, now hopefully uh, you do see my slides. I will be talking about uh, a recent paper on growth models in advanced countries before and after 2008, uh, meaning the global financial crisis. Uh, in particular on competitiveness, financial cycles, and austerity uh, as growth drivers. And the paper is co-authored uh, with Karsten Kohler, I should say. Uh, what is it that, uh, I, that we are doing in that paper? Let me give you a very brief preview of the core argument of the paper. It's an intervention in current debates in uh, comparative political economy, where there has been a certain shift from the varieties of capitalism approach, which uh, has a rather static institutional equilibrium approach towards a more dynamic demand-driven growth models approach, such as the one advocated by Bacaro and Pontusen. In that literature, there is uh, a frequent distinction between uh, two important growth models, the export-driven growth model and the debt-driven growth model. And what motivates our paper is the question to what extent are these 
two categories of export-driven and debt-driven growth still useful? To what extent uh, do these categories still apply to the post-2008 world? And the argument that we will be making is that uh, the varieties of capitalism approach and the growth models approach uh, have overemphasized price competitiveness uh, and have integrated financial factors and thus the concept of debt-driven growth uh, in an insufficiently reflected way. In particular, they've not taken uh, into account the cyclical nature of financial dynamics. Uh, and that is important for the interpretation of the uh, post-crisis growth experience. Uh, so what the paper will try to do is it will try to identify by, as a matter of fact, quite primitive means, uh, the key growth drivers since 2008. And we'll be specifically looking at areas of competitiveness. Here we're interested in the, uh, the issue of cost competitiveness versus non-cost competitiveness. Uh, we'll be interested in the issue of financial cycles, in particular on whether in the post-crisis uh, period we can think of debt-driven growth in reverse, meaning the same mechanisms of debt-driven growth still be there, but instead of generating growth, uh, generating stagnation or depression. Uh, and finally, we'll be looking uh, at austerity or more generally speaking, uh, at fiscal policy uh, and government responses. And we will be doing that uh, for uh, European countries and the US and I'll Methodologically, it's a very basic paper. Uh, it's essentially a set of simple binary cross-country plots for the decade uh, before the crisis and after the crisis. So essentially what it does is it's a basic plausibility test on different arguments regarding growth drivers. Uh, what's the structure of the presentation? Uh, I'll do a quite an extensive uh, background coverage, if you want. Uh, so the literature review will be quite a bit longer than usual. Uh, that is uh, in part after a conversation with Ricardo where he emphasized that uh, part of the audience is students. So I will take a bit more time to tell you uh, about debates in comparative political economy, introduce you to the uh, basic concept of post Keynesian economics and the growth model approach. Uh, in other words, I'll spend more time preparing the ground before I'm going to our actual paper, which is here under the heading of empirical analysis, and they will essentially walk you through the debates and uh, the empirical uh, indicators, and finally uh, we'll conclude and assess what our arguments mean for uh, the growth models uh, before and after the crisis, and what lessons comparative political economy. Uh, can draw from this work. So first, what is comparative political economy? Uh, political economy broadly is uh, an approach that argues uh, that one has to analyze political, social, and economic phenomena jointly. In other words, it's the, the classical economics approach before neoclassical economics was born uh, and before uh, we establish pure economics and can neatly separate them from political and social phenomena. Uh, the development of modern economics meant that the field of political economy split. Uh, and that's important because it means that uh, most of the heterodox, what we now know as heterodox economics approaches, uh, essentially have roots in classical political economy. Uh, and in the social sciences, with a bit of time delay, you get a reaction to that separation of the field of political economy in the emergence of distinct fields of international political economy, comparative political economy, uh, and economic sociology, which are all fields that in particular areas try to reunite analysis of political and uh, economic phenomena. Comparative political economy in that setting is the field that looks at uh, the 
institutions and growth performances across countries. So in other words, uh, it needs a theory of how institution works, it needs a theory of how the economy works, and it needs a story of how the two of them interact, how institutions feed into growth performance and how growth performance feeds back onto institutions. Um, that separation of the field of political economy into different disciplines has impacted, I would argue, the quality of the debate uh, with often in the social sciences an insufficient awareness of uh, modern heterodox economics and vice versa in heterodox economics, uh, more knowledge of mainstream economics than uh, uh, appreciation of debates in other fields of political economy. Uh, and uh, the, the general argument that I'm making that the comparative political economy can benefit from a stronger dose of post-Keynesian economics is meant as such a, if you want, a reunification of the fields of political economy. In the field of uh, comparative political economy, the VOC approach uh, since the early 2000s has become, uh, uh, the, if you want, a dominant uh, paradigm. The VOC approach is most famous for uh, counterposing the liberal uh, and the coordinated market economies, US, UK, versus Germany and Japan on the other hand, uh, and emphasizes that uh, those are different ways of achieving competitiveness. So it's an institutional competitive uh, theory of competitiveness or of uh, competitive uh, advantage. Uh, and different from uh, transaction cost economics or neoclassical economics, there's multiple equilibria. Uh, the, market e uh, the liberal market economies as well as the coordinated one can uh, generate uh, competitive outcomes. And uh, the Southern European countries are often grouped as the mixed market economies uh, in between the coordinated and the liberal ones. Now, to be a bit more specific, uh, let me take a look at uh, the VOC analyses of the Euro crisis, which typically argues that uh, the, the Eurozone brought together countries with different sets of institutions, in particular, the coordinated market economies have a system of wage coordination in place uh, that enables unions uh, to engage in wage constraint, essentially because the export, uh, the metal industry is the wage leader and other sectors are following the lead of that and thereby uh, the uh, uh, manufacturing unions that have an eye on export performance uh, keep wages such as such uh, as to guarantee that the economy is competitive. The mixed market economies uh, do not have that degree of wage coordination. And thus, uh, if the occasion arises, the non-tradable sectors will push up wages and thereby set in motion a round of inflationary pressures that it will eventually erode the competitiveness of the economy. Therefore, in <coughs> Uh, a system of monetary union, you will get unit labor cost divergence and the mixed market economies will lose competitiveness. To some extent, somewhat more ad hoc, uh, it is argued that the liberal and mixed market economies have also used credit to stimulate uh, domestic demand. But the core of the VOC analysis is around uh, cost divergence uh, and cost competitiveness. So essentially, uh, the, the, the euro crisis is then analyzed as one, as, uh, of a, as a crisis of cost divergence. Uh, Baccaro and Pontusen wrote an important paper in 2016 uh, that was arguing that uh, the VOC approach is too heavily focusing on uh, supply side phenomena, implicitly that it's building uh, on mainstream economics and is borrowing heavily from post-Keynesian economics uh, to develop a more demand-oriented analysis of growth performance. In particular, they pick up on the Kaletskian notion of wage-led growth. Uh, so Bakar and Pontusen argue uh, that the big shift uh, in post-war capitalism is that between a more Keynesian uh, for this period, roughly until 1980, uh, and a more neoliberal one uh, that Bakar and Pontus are analyzing as a shift from 
wage-led growth in the post-war era to profit-led growth uh, in, the, in the neoliberal area, which is, by the way, not uh, the way that post-Keynesians is in, uh, analyzing it, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but what they're overall suggesting is less focus on institutions uh, and on the supply side and more focus on uh, demand developments and a different role for income distribution and linking income distribution and growth. Uh, Hope and Soskic have replied to that and essentially defend uh, a more mainstream approach to economics. There's also several uh, uh, papers within a roughly CP perspective that come close to post-Keynesian notions uh, of debt-driven growth, in particular uh, Colin Crouch's privatized Keynesianism and several papers by uh, Colin Hay. Both of these papers emphasize the role of real estate prices, thus financial factors, essentially are only looking or mostly looking at the, uh, at the boom period. Uh, but are not inserting the analysis of the UK growth model into a broader picture of uh, comparative capitalisms. Uh, thus, they don't try to uh, develop that argument uh, more generally. Uh, we have similar concerns in other areas of political economy, in particular, uh, a very nice paper by uh, Blythe and Matthias uh, that is uh, making a related argument for the field of international political economy. Is also arguing that IPE is too much relying on uh, mainstream economics uh, and should, uh, in a way, do a Keynesian shift or, or think more about macroeconomics and macroeconomic instability. What you have here, more broadly speaking, is that since the global financial crisis, various fields in the social sciences of political economy are getting more interested in heterodox economics and macroeconomics in particular. Uh, so what is uh, Keynesian economics and uh, the, the, the paper that I'll be presenting is essentially a post-Keynesian uh, paper, a Keynesian paper, uh, if you prefer it that way. And so I'll briefly flesh out what Keynesian and post-Keynesian economics is. Uh, Keynesian economics essentially questions the self-healing properties of, the, of market economies, thus uh, employment will not naturally gravitate uh, to full employment markets do not necessarily clear. And a particular source of instability uh, are financial markets due to fundamental uncertainty and the role of expectations on financial markets. Uh, thus for Keynesians, uh, financial markets, financial instability are a source uh, for cyclical dynamics, for boom bust dynamics. Um, Immediately after Keynes's publication of the general theory, debate started on how Keynes's theory uh, relates to neoclassical economics. Keynes, of course, called his magnus opus the general theory uh, of employment, uh, money, and so on, uh, emphasizing that neoclassical theory is a special case of his general theory. In fact, most of the reactions uh, in mainstream economics were in the opposite direction. They were essentially attempts uh, to uh, uh, domesticate Keynesian arguments and to uh, interpret Keynesian arguments as special cases uh, of uh, a general neoclassical argument. They, there were two waves to that. Uh, the first was the ne neoclassical Keynesian synthesis that uh, brought about the ISLM model. And more recently and more strictly, micro-founded new Keynesian economics. That is what uh, Hope and Solskic want to base uh, the varieties of capitalism on. Uh, the post-Keynesians within that, if you want, are the radical wings of the Keynesians that emphasize that Keynes wanted to break with neoclassical economics and that want to generalize Keynesian theory. In particular, the first big project of the post-Keynesians was to move Keynesian analysis from the short run to the long run, most of uh, the general theory, not necessarily of Keynes's work uh, overall, but uh, certainly of the general theory, has a short run focus. Uh, and the post Keynesian initially were very concerned with turning that into a long run theory. Uh, so, a few words on the key features of post Keynesian economics. 
Uh, methodologically, it rejects uh, methodological individualism based on funda fundamental uncertainty. Uh, to deal with fundamental uncertainty, uh, institutions develop, social norms develop, uh, and thus you need an institutional, in many cases, class analytical uh, approach if you want to uh, have social foundations for economics. In terms of the macroeconomics, I want to highlight three elements of uh, post-Keynesian economics that will reappear uh, in the discussion of growth models. The first, which we could associate with the name Kalecki, is the possibility of uh, wage-led demand regimes. Uh, in other words, uh, wage income feeds into consumption expenditures and thus uh, in a recession, a wage cut will lead to a reduction uh, in consumption. Uh, what that argument says is that essentially, and that is what Keynes writes in uh, chapter 19 uh, of the genuine theory, in a situation of high unemployment in a recession, wage cuts will be counterproductive because they will undermine the largest source of domestic demand, consumption expenditures. Uh, the baduri margin model will then generalize that, but essentially what that says here is that uh, when the European Commission and the Troika talks about internal devaluation, you should be cautious with that argument. Uh, wage constraint will indeed have positive effects uh, on competitiveness, but it will have negative domestic demand effects. Thus, in other words, wages are a source of cost for companies, but they are also a source of income for households. Thus, uh, they are a two-edged sword, and overall, uh, uh, wages uh, can have a positive relation uh, uh, to economic activity. That's important because it means that the aggregate effective labor demand curve need not be downward sloping. A cut in wages does not necessarily need uh, lead to higher uh, labor demand. The policy implication of that, of course, is that you can't fight unemployment on the labor market, uh, labor market deregulation, but on the goods market and you need government spending for that. The second uh, important ingredient uh, in modern post-Keynesian economics is a, is a development, further development of Keynesian arguments around financial instability. In Keynes, we have theories of liquidity crisis, of the flight uh, uh, to liquidity and safety in a crisis. You have unstable social norms that break down in the face of a crisis. Hyman Minsky, developed it into a theory of endogenous financial instability, endogenous financial crisis. There's two versions of them, one more centered around asset prices and different forms of expectation formation, momentum trading, as it's often referred to. Uh, and uh, in Minsky, in the original writings, you also find a version where uh, financial instability uh, is the flip side of uh, optimistic outlook and investment by non-financial businesses that are taking on more leverage during uh, the boom. But in both cases, what you have is that uh, with the boom, you get changes in expectations, changes uh, in what uh, is normal, and that leads uh, banks, financial institutions, as well as non-financial businesses in household to accept uh, riskier investment and riskier financial structures. In other words, they take on more leverage. Therefore, during the boom, financial fragility increases because you get more and more highly indebted units. The third ingredient uh, of uh, post-Keynesian economics uh, concerns uh, supply-side adjustment. There is a role for supply in post-Keynesian economics, but overall, uh, post-Keynesians are much more tilted uh, towards demand-led growth processes. Uh, so you can associate that with the name of Niklas Kaldor, who argued that uh, supply will adjust to demand pressures, uh, the, the notion of induced technological progress, so the Kaldor we are unloaded. If you have high rates of economic growth, you're encouraging technological progress, and thus you will end up with higher productivity. Uh, one specific aspect of that is that uh, the notion of uh, that we have an endogenous Nairo uh, or that uh, structural, uh, that actual unemployment feeds back into structural unemployment. The Naira is an important uh, element of modern uh, mainstream economics, uh, of the applied uh, 
uh, sort uh, entrusted inflation neutral unemployment, uh, Paul Keynesians would argue, is uh, endogenous. I trust that you're aware that Keynesian and post Keynesian economics has quite different policy conclusions uh, from uh, mainstream economics, but in the interest of time, I'll skip that. Uh, a word on uh, demand regimes that play an important role in what I will tell you in a few minutes. Uh, that notion, a, a particular branch of uh, post Keynesian, in particular Kaletskian uh, economics, deals with the relation of distribution and demand. Uh, the the well-known Baduri Maglin model become, became an important reference point there. What this model essentially tries to do is create a synthesis or a bridge between Keynesian or Kaletskian arguments on the one hand and Marxian arguments on the other hand. Keynes and Kaletsky are arguing that the wage cut in the recession actually may make things worse. That's of course the opposite of what a lot of Marxists, in particular uh, the famous uh, uh, Richard Goodwin uh, cycles we are telling you, uh, what is known as the profit squeeze crisis, that, well, uh, if uh, firms' profits go down, they will, in less, they will invest less, and thus, if you have a low profit rate, uh, you'll get uh, a crisis. The baduri maglin model tries to disentangle that, tries to bring those two arguments together in one model and identify the conditions uh, under which you'll get wage-led growth and under which conditions you'll get profit-led growth. And the core of that is that, well, if you have uh, a wage cut, you'll have a negative effect on consumption, but you can have a positive effect on investment. It's the theoretically more interesting one, but for economic policy and empirical analysis, there's also the effect of the wage cut on exports, or more specifically net exports. So the question empirically then is, how large is that export effect relative to say the consumption effect? Is the overall economy wage-led or is it profit-led? Now the baduri maglin model started out with discussions of what happens if you have a change of income distribution. But of course we can define demand regimes not only with respect to income distribution, but also with respect uh, to other key shift variables. The most important candidate for that, certainly from a Minskian perspective, is asset prices, house prices, share prices, and household debt uh, or uh, business debt. And thus, uh, one branch or one uh, other version of demand regime analysis distinguishes between debt-led demand regimes and debt-burdened uh, demand regimes. Now, uh, higher debt means that uh, those with a high margin propensity to spend uh, will have more access to finance, but uh, in the following year, they will have to re repay their loan and will have to pay interest rates. Thus, in the short run, there's a redistribution to people with uh, a high margin propensity to spend. In the long run, the distribution is in the opposite direction when the loan gets repaid. Thus, uh, the debt uh, led and debt burdened elements here have a strong time element. We can also think of uh, the fiscal multiply in this context and ask how much GDP changes if we spend uh, change government expenditures. Here, the sign is relatively clear. As Keynesians, we would expect that to be positive, but how positive? How large is the multiplier? And in particular, uh, does the multiplier decline over longer periods? Does it go back to zero as the new Keynesians say, or does it remain positive? Uh, what have post Keynesians done with that? Uh, that framework of uh, wage-led, profit-led uh, growth is interesting because it can uh, depict a variety uh, of uh, constellations. So think of a simple two by two matrix. On uh, the one axis, we depict on whether the economic structure is wage-led or profit-led, meaning once we have a change in income distribution, uh, does GDP uh, grow uh, more or does it shrink? We can combine that, that's the other axis, with actional distributional changes. Are they pro-capital or are they pro-labor? Um, that simple two by two matrix is useful because we can insert different economic policy strategies in there, different economic theories, if you want. The pro-capital income distribution changes in a profit-led economy, if you want, is neoliberalism in theory. That's strictly down growth. If the rich get richer, that's fine. Eventually, the breadcrumbs will trickle all the way down to the poor guys. 
uh, to the right of that, we will ha would have the well-intended social reformers in a profit-led uh, demand regime that doomed social reforms. That is where Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative. You might have all the best intentions of the world, but it doesn't work economically. Uh, now, certain part of the post-Keynesian literature was emphasizing if we think of actually existing neoliberalism as opposed to neoliberalism in theory, uh, the demand regime remained wage-led. Uh, so we didn't have that positive loop between higher profits and higher business investment. Where neoliberal economies have grown, it was actually via household consumption and real estate booms or export-driven growth. So that's a literature that emphasizes that uh, actually existing neoliberalism is in a wage-led demand regime with pro-capital income distribution, and we get additional growth stimulation, debt-driven growth or export-driven growth. Uh, and that's the book where we elaborated these theories uh, that uh, Marc Lavoie and I edit. And I'll skip the next slide because I realize that I'm using more time than I intended to, and we'll move on to the empirical analysis. So again, what is it that we are trying to do? We're trying to contribute to those recent debates uh, after Bakao and Pontusen uh, on uh, combining uh, comparative political economy and post-Keynesian economics via the notion of demand-driven growth models. And we particularly want to interrogate the notions of export-driven and debt-driven growth and wonder in this uh, paper how useful these categories are to describe the post-2008 situation. Now, those two categories were developed essentially in the decade before the crisis and with the experience uh, and the divergences of the crisis. So they come out of a specific historic uh, constellation. And we will be arguing that uh, the, the growth model approach should not be reduced to the distinction of export-driven and debt-driven uh, growth models, uh, but we have to consider a richer set of uh, uh, growth drivers. In particular, we will argue that the focus on competitiveness and price competitiveness is overstated. Uh, unit labor costs are not as important as uh, say the VOC analysis of uh, the Euro crisis suggests. Um, and in particular, the increase uh, in competitiveness due to say uh, internal devaluation, wage restraint comes at the expense of, of uh, internal demand, domestic demand, and thus overall may not be uh, positively contributing uh, to, uh, to growth. Second, um, we're arguing that financial factors have often been included in an, in an ad hoc fashion. In particular, comparative political economy does not take the notion of financial cycle seriously. And that results in an analysis that debt-driven growth is analyzed literally as debt-driven growth, but not as also entailing as a uh, organic part debt-driven stagnation or the downturn of the financial cycle. And third, we are arguing that uh, that literature uh, does not take fiscal policy or the state very seriously, which for the pre-2008 period may not be that important, but for the post-2008, in particular, the, the euro crisis situation is important. Uh, so let me give you an illustration uh, that uh, by a paper by uh, Eckhart Heim and Pasquale Trinico uh, that uh, just a few weeks ago came out in the review of international political economy. And uh, Eckhart Hein is actually a post-Keynesian econo economist and uh, that classification of growth models that he does here for the post-crisis period actually is similar to the one that he had in the book that I just showed you. What is that paper essentially doing? Uh, it's distinguishing, identifying export-led models, domestic demand-led and debt-led models. And it does so by essentially saying, well, what's the growth contribution of net exports, or the current account more precisely, to GDP and GDP growth? That's the one question. And you can answer yes, uh, that contributes to growth or no, didn't contribute to growth. Uh, and then it asks, uh, how much did households borrow? So what's uh, the 
the financial balance of households and you can extend that to, to the private business sector. Did they have a net borrowing or a net lending position? And based on that, then you can uh, identify whether regimes are export-led, uh, domestic demand-led, or uh, uh, debt-led. There actually is a, uh, a surprisingly big gray area in between. Uh, and that is that you can have countries that have positive uh, net exports, but negative net export growth contributions. Uh, and for the post-crisis period, uh, that actually becomes important. But that's not my, my main concern uh, with what we have here, that gray zone. My main concern is that this framework essentially tries to classify countries into either export driven or debt driven. And it does so essentially by looking at growth outcomes and the structure of the growth outcome that you observe. What I'll be arguing is that that neglects or downplays potential other growth drivers that have been important. So let us do two thought experiments. First, assume a country that had a financial boom, uh, therefore had high current account deficits, uh, and then comes the financial crash. So because of the financial crash, households start uh, deleveraging. They start spending less, saving more. In other words, their financial balance shifts into positive. What you get as a ref uh, uh, an effect of that is weak domestic demand and therefore, uh, however marginal, an improvement of net exports. If you look uh, it, uh, the classification that I showed you is how will that country be classified? It will have domestic demand-led growth. And that is what we find for the US and UK post-2008 according to that framework. Now, from a mean scheme perspective, what you have here is deleveraging. This is still a debt-driven economy. You get uh, the, 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 the increase in household saving precisely because of financial dynamics, because households feel that they're over-indebted. So from that perspective, what you have is still uh, a, a debt-driven or a financial, uh, a finance-led economy, not a domestic demand-led economy. But we can develop that argument further. Now assume a similar country, financial boom, high current account deficits, financial crash, households start deleveraging. Now assume that for whatever reasons, uh, the government in that country starts saying, well, we need to balance the budget. In other words, it engages in austerity. This is essentially the situation that the Southern European countries think Spain found themselves in. Now, what do you get in these countries? You get a collapse of domestic demand, and therefore you get uh, a substantial improvement in the current account. So what you end up with is that Spain, Italy, Portugal, Greece, in Heinz framework are weakly export-led. They're classified as export-led economies because net exports have a positive growth contribution. Now, in my book, what you have here is, well, you have an aggressive deleveraging. You still have a debt uh, finance-led economy that's amplified by anti-Keynesian austerity. So in other words, what I'm saying here is that this framework is biased towards finding export-led growth, and it classifies countries as having an export-led growth regimes where the actual growth drivers are either related uh, to fiscal policy decisions or to financial dynamics, but not uh, to the export side. So what do we do? We try to have a broader approach. We look at competitiveness, both cost and non-cost competitiveness. We look at finance and we need a fiscal policy. For each of these, uh, there are certain uh, debates that the paper uh, says more about, but in the interest of time, I will actually not say much more about that. Other than the first one on competitiveness, uh, there has been a discussion on uh, in particular with respect to Germany, how important price competition was for German export or to what extent actually it's a more structural feature. Uh, in particular, Sarah Sturm has argued that uh, the German uh, uh, exports are actually not very price sensitive. The uh, Southern European uh, exports are more price sensitive and thus it's actually not about unit labor costs. Uh, the flip side of that is that he's arguing uh, much like uh, I uh, or Dirk Besemer, 
uh, the, 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 the euro crisis is best understood as a financial crisis uh, where uh, the European Monetary Union allowed for capital flows that amplified local real estate booms uh, and then went into reverse uh, as most financial booms collapse at some point. And what you then uh, got because of the specific architecture of the euro area uh, is a sovereign debt crisis because the ECB didn't sufficiently uh, support uh, uh, the southern member states. Uh, either way, in uh, the, the, around the uh, competitiveness, uh, there's the question on is it price competitiveness or is it uh, other forms of competitiveness? And we will be using uh, the measure of experts of sophistication, the economic uh, complexity index. For finance, we'll be using uh, real estate prices and household debt. Uh, and uh, for, um, uh, for government policy, we'll be using the cyclically adjusted primary government balance. That's not an innocent measure because of how you do the cyclical adjustment, uh, but as it's A, widely used, and B, still contains some information, we'll, we'll be using it. The unit labor costs, I should say that uh, we're using other ones for manufacturing because that's uh, the tradable sector uh, and not uh, the, the, the national unit labor cost. Economic complexity is essentially a measure of the variety of inputs and the variety of export markets. Uh, that you have, and out of that, uh, uh, Hidalgo and Hausmann are constructing the, the complexity index. What I'll do now is I'll show you a series of binary um, scatter plots with simple regression lines in. So what we're doing is a very basic, it's a cross-country exercise, uh, but we think that's uh, appropriate for comparative political economy. Uh, and it's essentially a simple plausibility test. Does, do the two variables link uh, in the way that are consistent with the story that this factor uh, is important and that it has contributed to growth? Strictly speaking, we can't talk about causality, but that's a different matter. The country groups that we'll be looking at, actually I'll not talk about this because th th there's nothing innovative here. Uh, that's the stylized facts that we want to explain. Uh, the continental Northern European countries had a decline uh, of the growth rate uh, and uh, an improvement in current accounts, somewhat surprisingly. The Southern European countries had a sharp decline uh, of growth uh, pre to post crisis and an improvement in current account. Eastern Europe is the best growth performance, uh, but also a sharp decline. Uh, and uh, uh, US, UK, what we call here financial uh, centers, uh, uh, maintain uh, their current account positions. Uh, now comes the series of scatter plots. The first is for price competitiveness. So that's normally ULC's unit labor costs in manufacturing, which is uh, the most trade export sector. And what you find here is a weak negative link uh, for the pre-crisis period. So in other words, uh, what that suggests is that export competitiveness did to some extent meet the pre-crisis, but uh, the coefficient is not statistically significant and the slope is pretty flat as you see, but there is uh, a, a bit of a negative uh, cross-country correlation. If we look at the post-crisis period, we actually get a positive slope. So what that suggests to us is that overall, the link between unit labor cost growth and real GDP growth is actually weak to non-existent. And that also holds if instead of real GDP growth, uh, we put the change of the net export position on the left axis. That's the same plots for non-price competitiveness. So that's the economic complexity index by Hidalgo and Hausmann. Uh, what that, and what you would expect here is a positive uh, link that um, uh, complexity is uh, related positively to, to exports and thus positively uh, to GDP growth. Uh, and indeed, in a, in a paper by Hidalgo and Hausmann, they found that for, uh, in particular, for developing countries, that's a, a useful growth predictor. 
And what we find here is that while there's essentially no relation uh, pre-crisis, post-crisis, we do find a positive link, which to us would suggest that uh, it's more consistent with the story that post-crisis at least uh, non-price competitiveness was more important uh, than price competitiveness. These are the plots uh, for house prices and household debt. Uh, both pre and post crisis, we find a quite strong link between house prices and growth. Now, debt, of course, is uh, the strongest evidence uh, that uh, for a finance led uh, growth regime, because it suggests that the probably mo currently most important financial variable, house prices, are uh, positive related to GDP growth, uh, both before and after the crisis. Uh, and if you look at the right hand scale, what you do see here is that you have a lot of countries, almost half of them, where you have negative real house price growth. And therefore, what you'll get is a negative effect on real GDP growth. So in other words, that would suggest that uh, the, the uh, finance led growth uh, goes up and down. Uh, the picture is a bit more complicated for household debt. You get the positive relation as expected uh, or pre-crisis, but you'll get a, a much weaker link post-crisis. That's interesting. I don't think it's entirely uh, surprising or uh, uh, implausible. Essentially what you find here, or what I suspect that you find here is that in a real estate boom, the economies are quick in building up debt, and thus there is a strong link between uh, house prices and household debt. In the downturn of the house price boom, households have to deleverage, and that's much more complicated than taking on new debt. Uh, it's a much more painful and a much slower process, and thus I think what you see on the right lower diagram is uh, that the link between household debt uh, and real estate prices to some extent uh, breaks down uh, in, uh, the, or at least for a while, weakens uh, in the downturn. Uh, that's an illustration of the financial cycle that plots changes in household debt. We can do the same for uh, real estate prices before and after the crisis. And essentially what you say, see here is that countries that had a high household debt, high real estate price growth before the crisis uh, have a decline afterwards. So in other words, that's evidence for cyclical dynamics. Finally, uh, we have fiscal balances. Um, that's uh, the cyclically adjusted uh, fiscal balance. And uh, somewhat to my own surprise, for both periods, we find a relatively strong uh, and uh, relatively statistically significant uh, uh, link between the two. Uh, statistically significance is stronger uh, post-crisis, but actually if you look at the coefficient, it's not that uh, different pre-crisis. So what I suspect that you see is that pre-crisis you had less variation in fiscal policy than post-crisis. Uh, as post-crisis you have some countries that did quite aggressive fiscal tightening. Uh, that is uh, a table from another paper of mine where uh, we calculated it. As you may or may not be aware, there's a very interesting discussion on what is called regime-dependent multipliers. Uh, traditional multiplier estimates, and there's a whole literature and technical difficulties on how to identify multiplier effect and avoid simultaneity. Uh, but there's an argument that in a recession, in particular in a financial crisis, fiscal multipliers might be substantially larger than prior to the crisis. You might remember Olivier Blanchard had this famous paper, Blanchard and Lai, uh, arguing that the IMF massively underestimated the impact of fiscal tightening uh, for Greece. And what he found there and what other uh, studies have confirmed that is in a recession, you often get multiplier levels of two or three as opposed to multiplier levels of one or below one uh, as in, post, uh, pre, uh, in, in growth periods. What the table does is it looks at these multiplier, regime dependent multiplier effects and multiplies them with the actual fiscal policies that the countries uh, uh, engaged in. And what you see there is that in 2008, 2009, the Southern European countries and the core countries essentially had similar fiscal policy responses. They had Keynesian uh, counter cyclical fiscal policy responses. Whereas in the Euro area, uh, so in the Euro crisis, what we have here is 2010 to 14, 
you get very opposite uh, reactions. You essentially get neutral fiscal policy uh, in the core countries, and you get anti-Keynesian austerity policy in the Southern European countries. And the growth contributions that you get out of that are actually quite large and certainly economically significant. So th that's another illustration of that argument that fiscal policy post 2008, or in particular post 2010, really made a big difference. Uh, so the main findings uh, that we have, I think I have to move fast forward because I realized that I'm out of time. Uh, so I hope that is my last slide. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, so what are the implications of uh, these findings for uh, the growth model approach and the ongoing debate? The argument that we've tried to make is that- uh, uh, Excuse me, Engelbert. Uh, growth model uh, I mean, approach it's... is a very useful one, but it's uh, important categories, state-led growth and export-led growth. Uh, certainly how they are conceived in literature now are too narrow and that uh, comparative political economy and the growth models approach should broaden its analysis of uh, uh, growth drivers. Uh, there are three aspects to that. The first is financialization comes with financial cycles. In the Hein paper that I quoted, the debt-led growth is actually called debt-led private consumption boom. In other words, it's formulated in such a way that there's only a positive version of debt-led growth debt-led stagnation or the downturn of the boom actually doesn't feature. Yeah? So what we're insisting here is think of financialization unleashing financial cycles, thus debt-led growth will also come with debt-led stagnation, or at least with a financial crisis, and how much stagnation, how much depression you get will then depend on government response, essentially fiscal policy response. That's the central role of fiscal policy. Uh, in a financial crisis, fiscal policy will be more effective, will have a stronger impact than on the growth period. So it really matters how government reacts. That's a big lesson of if you read uh, uh, Adam Tooze's book, Crashed. It's very strongly emphasizing governments until the euro crisis actually were quite Keynesian. They run massive budget deficits. In 2008, 2009, it really reversed in uh, uh, 20, uh, 2011, 2012, and you do feel that in the growth numbers. Um, now, th there's a more conceptual element of that, uh, much as we had in, in uh, about finance, that is how do we think of the state, much of the growth models and certainly the varieties of capitalism uh, with its institutional focus, think of uh, fiscal policy as neutral in the long run. In, in other words, we're in a new classical world, where the multiplier in the long run is zero, and thus you don't have the possibility, even theoretically, of state-led growth. So what that argument about fiscal policy implies is that you should conceive of, at least possibly, state-led growth as a, as a growth model. Finally, in terms of price competitiveness, or competitiveness, uh, there's a role for competitiveness, but it's overrated in, uh, certainly in, by, by, the, uh, by the VOC approach. Uh, and we would argue that certainly in the context of the Euro crisis, internal devaluation, which was all about competitiveness, actually backfired, uh, has increased net exports, but at the same time undermined domestic growth and ended up not delivering growth. Part of that is uh, that there's cost as well as non-cost components to competitiveness. And what we find is that um, non-cost competitiveness uh, is actually uh, uh, more important in the post-crisis period than cost competitiveness does. In other words, we are coming down on the storm side uh, more than on the La Pavitza side uh, of, of the uh, cost competitiveness debates. But with that, I think I have used up my time and shall stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Engelbert. Uh, Thank you for your stimulating presentation and also for uh, doing your best to leave some time for discussion. Uh, so I will now open the floor for um, questions and comments. Uh, I would like to, for those of you who are following us on, uh, on Zoom to, to use the raise hand uh, button 
that uh, you can find when you click in participants or in a chat. Uh, so please do raise your hand. For those of you who are following us on YouTube, I would kindly ask you to leave your questions in a written form. So the floor is open for discussion. Uh, while I'm uh, waiting for someone to, to move forward, I will start with uh, one, maybe two provocative uh, questions uh, to, to Angelbert. Um, well, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, I think your, your paper uh, puts forward many issues that are uh, really important for those of us who work on, on uh, growth models and uh, work on growth regimes. And for those that uh, uh, care about uh, the, the present and the future of um, the different economies of the European Union. Now, I would like to, to, to to ask the, the following. Uh, if we look at the, the post adjustment period, we find that the that external demand was uh, in fact uh, an important driver in the recovery of the Portuguese economy. Uh, maybe it's not totally apparent from the data you collect because you use the time period uh, 2008 to 2017. And uh, actually, the adjustment period uh, was active uh, after 2010, 2012, uh, 2011, I'm sorry. But in any case, um, external demand was important. And tourism, in, in particular, was an important driver of the recovery, especially in, in creating employment. Now, um, and this happened although the specialization profile of the country did not improve or uh, according to your data even worsened. Uh, can this be a sign that the wage deflation strategy succeeded actually in improving the, the country's uh, competitiveness? Was there a second question? Well, you want a, a second one? <laughs> I thought okay. you had to. Okay, I, I, I can uh, make uh, another one, which is also uh, the, the first one. Actually, I gave the, the Portuguese case, but this this can apply to to other uh, countries where tourism the tourism boom uh, was an important uh, source of of growth, and it's actually uh, a sector that is based on on low wages. Uh, so I would say that we can uh, bail out uh, some of La Pavitza's and uh, Flashback's uh, thesis on, on this. That was the, the, the second question is more focused on, on the Portuguese uh, case, specifically on the Portuguese case, and it has to do with the, with the following. When we look at the, the detailed data that you present in, the, in your paper, in the pre-crisis period, uh, Portugal comes out as a quite distinct case when compared to the average uh, Southern uh, European countries in indicators uh, such as uh, real uh, GNI growth, growth in manufacturing unit labor costs, uh, real house prices growth. Uh, does it make sense, and this is the case of Portugal, we could uh, probably find other examples, uh, does it make sense to keep using uh, all these aggregates like uh, gypsies and uh, uh, the other four uh, three aggregates that you use when there is such uh, can be such a uh, wide diversity uh, between the countries that are uh, merged in, in these uh, broad uh, classifications? Okay, uh, both very interesting questions. Um, I don't think I have much of an answer on the first one. I have to admit I know very little about Portugal. Um, I guess my question to you would be, so when you emphasize the, okay, but one, come on first. I think it's clear that exports potentially are quite important. And for a lot of countries uh, in recession, of course, exports, it, sorry, for a lot of countries in severe re recessions, exports are a stabilizing factor. Uh, 
because whenever you have a worse recession than your neighbors, of course, their demand will stabilize your economy. So potentially, of course, they do play a role. I also think that in the, develop, in, in the context of developing economies, there is a genuine role uh, for export-led growth in the sense that, uh, and that's Kaldor's uh, and Servo's uh, and, and so on argument, in the sense that it's the export sector that will be manufacturing and it's manufacturing that is likely to have the highest productivity growth. And if you want to develop those sectors, there will be a point where domestic demand will just not do it. If you want to develop these sectors, you need export growth. Yeah? So in that sense, I do think there is a genuine meaning and usefulness to an export-led growth strategy. Where I'm a lot more skeptical is when that gets applied to Germany or to advanced economies and where it gets connected uh, with uh, the notion of price competitiveness. And essentially, the conclusion gets drawn from the ULS, ULC position to the current account positions. Germany, post-crisis, has actually seen modest increases in its current account position, but actually its ULC position has worsened relative to other countries, which is a reflection of the fact that uh, essentially, most of Europe has done internal devaluation and therefore the Southern European countries brought down the unit labor costs more aggressively than Germany in the post-crisis period. But they didn't hurt German exports uh, because Germany was exporting to East Asia and East Asia was growing fast. So Germany, it, it, exports in the post-crisis period are not as important for German growth as in the pre-crisis period but Germany still managed to further increase its export surpluses, but it's not because it gained competitiveness. It's because of other factors. Right? It, it's about the structure of with whom you're trading uh, and um, uh, uh, the, the sort of sectors uh, that you're in. The second theoretical issue of the, of the uh, Sturm, uh, Flasbeck, uh, Lapavitsas debate is in a way, how should we think of the Eurozone? Should we primarily think of it as a fixed exchange rate uh, area where the, the, the Euro means that the, the, the nominal exchange rates get fixed? Or should we primarily think of it as uh, a common financial area that unleashes capital flows? And in that sense, the big effect of the euro is not so much on the exchange rate or trade side, but it's on the capital flow side and on the credit volumes that you're unleashing in those countries that you have surpluses. And in that story, it's the capital flows that are generating uh, the, and, and thereby credit that is generating the growth in Southern Europe and thereby pulling in the German uh, uh, exports rather than German gains of competitiveness crowding out uh, whatever Spanish industry. Yeah? Now, that's the, the general issues at stake. Uh, I would be very interesting to learn what the sectors and what the trade partners of Portugal was. I mean, to what extent was that the, the, the growth performance in the trade partners and to what extent can the, the Portuguese export performance actually been linked to whatever internal devaluation, wage constraint, and what have you. Can, can I give- Well, actually that is an, yes, it is an open question and it is a very delicate one, of course, because we are basically judging the effectiveness of the, the austerity strategy here. Uh, but I would say that at this point, uh, we have to, to take it as an open question. Um, in the sense, it's if you look at the, the, the export sectors that have been growing and contributing uh, quite positively to, to growth in the recent years, before COVID, of course, uh, they were all based on uh, price competitiveness. And in this sense, uh, it's not totally clear that uh, internal devaluation is totally indifferent uh, to this. Having said this, uh, 
there is an important point that you make, which is we have to take into account the financial cycle and uh, part of the explanation for the huge contribution of the external demand is the fact that uh, growth is not that strong. And so the relative weight of external demand becomes higher. Uh, this is one point. So this doesn't mean that the, these countries have become uh, a weak uh, external demand led uh, uh, regime economies um, but it, it also it's also not clear to what extent uh, the growth of these sectors even though they are uh, low price uh, based to what extent the, their growth has basically to do with, with external demands because just as you say that uh, part of the success of Germany's export has to do with the partners with whom they trade. It might be the case that part of the success in tourism, the recent success in tourism has also to do with the success of the uh, countries where uh, tourists come from. So I think we don't know enough yet to, to have a definite say on this. Uh, but I think that uh, this is still an open question. I, I don't think uh, we can uh, immediately say that uh, the, the role of price competi competitiveness has not been uh, relevant in, in the post-crisis period. And I am ex extremely curious to see uh, how the, the results of this paper of yours come out when you put it together on a multivariate uh, framework. Mm -hmm by the way you're thinking about this, aren't you? Yes, we, we will at some point, but uh, we, we are not yet. I, I can okay. briefly also comment on your, on your second point uh, on how useful are the country groups. Uh, short answer is, it, it's really mixed. They, they, they are and they aren't useful. Uh, to, to give that some meaning. Now, first, for the core argument that we are making, our scatter plots actually, we don't need country groups. We essentially use the country groups to, to use the standard blocks. And I don't think we're doing anything innovative with the country blocks. That said, there is an aspect where they are useful. And that is essentially, if you think of econo international economic structures, in a core periphery framework. So in other words, if you let your structuralist self take over and think of core periphery, uh, then it does make sense. The question is, do we have meaningful criteria by which to group them? And I would think yes. Uh, I think we can think of a productive core and periphery and we can think of a financial core and periphery. The productive periphery is essentially the argument about uh, global value chains essentially uh, Poland in terms of manufacturing is peripheral to, to the German production networks because that's how the car industry works. I do think there's also a meaningful concept of financial core and periphery. And there's two elements of that to that. The first is uh, that's essentially the argument of Keynes's liquidity preference going international. It's a, a hierarchy of currencies uh, which means that different countries will be charged different interest rates depending on where they are on the pecking order. That's if you want in the peaceful times and the, the, that uh, the interest rate spread of course um, is typically pro cyclical. But as we've seen in this crisis, even more importantly, the point where you really see the divergence of financial core and financial periphery is in the financial crisis and the question is, which countries do you have capital flights from and wh which countries are they flying to? Because one of the fascinating things that we learned in the global financial crisis is that if you have a global financial crisis that emanates in the US, the US dollar does not have to worry and the US government does need not worry about selling its government bonds, despite the fact that the global financial crisis originated there. And that has something to do with the position of the US in the global financial system and the fact is that it's effectively the reserve currency. The same holds for Germany and uh, for the UK. And that is very different uh, from uh, the, the emerging markets. You have that both in 2008 
but you again had it with the COVID crisis, where the first thing that you had was you had a flight to safety and uh, capital flight from the emerging markets and uh, appreciation of the US dollar. The Euro area in a way created a structure in terms of sovereign debt that amplified the financial peri peripheralization of Southern European countries in a way, because they lost their, their autonomous currencies. And we had uh, a, a European Central Bank that initially did not support all its member states. And thus the stage was opened for a sovereign debt crisis. So to me, that's part of the, uh, uh, of the international financial hierarchy and it does create a core periphery structure. And in that sense, uh, if we think of uh, industrial and uh, financial cores and peripheries, country group banks do make sense. Yeah. That sense, it's apparent if you look at the economic performance of Greece, Italy, Spain, uh, and Ireland, and Portugal is probably uh, somewhere in the middle right there of those countries, they reacted completely different. So in that sense, it, it's clearly not useful or it only tells you so much. Uh, but I would not fully discard them, uh, but certainly some uh, arguments from heterodox economists, possibly also early papers from myself did overstate the similarity of, of the two okay. countries. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'll now give the floor to Gonzalo, Gonzalo Amado. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, thank you Ricardo. And thank you, Professor, for this, for this pre presentation. Uh, I, I just, I, actually, I prepared three questions uh, uh, during, during my, my analysis of uh, your paper, but you, you just answer, answer uh, during your presentation one of them. So um, I have just uh, two questions to you. And um, the, the first one um, is related to the Visegrad, to the Visegrad uh, countries, as you, as you mentioned on the paper. Uh, the Visegrad countries uh, seem to, to have a, a growth model that, that is uh, highly dependent uh, on the northern, not the northern and Germany European countries. Uh, which uh, does not uh, seem uh, sustainable uh, when the, the former uh, are advancing uh, in the in the process of macroeconomic convergence to the um, to the European levels. Um, what will be the growth model uh, of the these Visegrad countries uh, when they reach the the saturation point? Uh, in their uh, growth model is the, the, the first question. And the, the, second, the second one um, is, um, as you know, uh, an economic uh, recovery plan uh, is under discussion uh, in the European Union uh, through a, a fiscal stimulus, a fiscal package of, of uh, stimulus. Uh, do you believe that uh, the counterpart of this stimulus will be the imposition of a German uh, type growth model uh, to the countries that benefit from this from this package on, and these ben benefits? Okay, thanks for this. Um, Visegrad countries. Um, I have to admit, I don't know what the saturation point of the Visegrad countries is. Overall, they're performing much better than I would have expected them to perform. Uh, I mean, it's clear that they have a quite subordinate role in the German uh, global value chains. But so far, they've been doing pretty good with it. Uh, they actually have the highest growth rate, they are still catching up, whereas Southern European countries since 2008, uh, we have divergence rather than convergence. Um, and that is also quite clearly reflected in uh, the, the higher productivity numbers. If you look at labor productivity growth, if you look at economic complexity indices, they are doing surprisingly well there. 
How far that can... Uh, now, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would not have expected. I would have... I would probably have told you that uh, the, the global financial crisis will be a quite sensitive turning point for Southern Europe, but also for Eastern Europe. Uh, it, it's good that you didn't ask me 10 years ago, um, because effectively they've, they've grown faster. Now, they have had a quite substantial immigration. I understand as Portugal or, or other Southern European countries. Uh, so, I mean, they do have a lot of internal uh, problems, but if you look at the, the, the macroeconomic indicators, it's not too bad. Is it dangerous for them? Uh, well, it, I mean, the, the certainly you can think of enough dangers, that, and that's essentially that cost-sensitive production shifting further to the east. And uh, I mean, if you're whatever the, the Poland or the Czech Republic, you don't have to look very far east to see where this could go. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's a, a quite real danger that it will first go to Bulgaria, Romania, and then further east, what have you. On the other hand, they may also to some extent stabilize where now Austria is. Austria is also, in terms of the industry, essentially a province of Germany. Not, not politically, I happen to be Austrian, uh, and so we are quite... Uh, uh, determined to keep our independence politically, but economically there's only so much of it. But the matter of the fact is Austria hasn't been doing that badly with it. So it might be that there is a bit of a niche uh, for the, the, the Eastern European countries. It also initially looked uh, that the Eastern European countries would be hit a lot harder in terms of the, the financial outflows because uh, they, they did initially have uh, financial outflows. And if I remember correctly, Hungary was actually one of the first countries 2008 that had to ask for an, an IMF package. Um, they, they, and they also, in particular Hungary, did have a very high amount of foreign denominated private sector debt. But somewhat to my surprise, they managed it. Uh, and in their case, the dominance, in particular on the financial sector uh, of, of international banks, didn't hurt them that much, but did seem to have stabilized. So, in short, I don't have an answer. I can just reinforce the puzzle there. <laughs> that, that is there. Um, in terms of the euro area, financial stimulus, and to what extent will that create a German-type growth model? Now, I think it's very important that in the context of the, uh, of the COVID crisis, Europe or the European Union is at least discussing European fiscal policy again. Uh, that is badly overdue. It, it was a, a terrible and socially ex and economically extremely costly mistake uh, that they did by, by imposing austerity and by uh, not uh, dealing with the sovereign debt crisis. And essentially what the euro area did and how it got by was by the ECB against making a U-turn in its policy and after Draghi's statement that they will do whatever it takes, they actually did behave like a normal central bank and uh, beg the government debt of its member states. Now, it's from an economic point of view, if you think about it, completely absurd that they didn't do that from the beginning, but eventually they did. I mean, they initially put pressure uh, on Southern European countries, most of all on Greece, to uh, behave fiscally. Uh, and once they, they, they stopped uh, the debt conditionality and actually started buying government bonds, surprise, surprise, uh, things stabilized. Now, you can play that for a while, and in particular, in times of crisis, it's extremely important that you play that, um, because that's how you, you stop the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, but of course, ultimately, what you need is a fiscal capacity. There's only so long that the, the, the European Central Bank can compensate for there not being a European debt instrument and there not being uh, the European fiscal policy. Remember, in the United States, 
uh, the, the, the states have balanced budget requirements, uh, but the way that it's compensated for the US overall is that the federal government is actually running uh, Keynesian policy and, and counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Yeah? Europe tr tries to pretend that it cannot have a European budget and still restrain its member states. No? That, that's not going to work. You, you need some level where the counter cyclical fiscal policy comes from. So, so you either let the, the, the nation states do it or you do it at the European level, but you can't have a debt break on both of them. And so what the European Union now is doing is baby steps. Uh, it will have to speed that up just because of the, the enormity of the cost of, of the COVID crisis. But at least it seems to be moving in that direction. And once the gene is out of the bottle and once uh, the, the, the European Union has a fiscal capacity, I think it will be evident that that's useful and it will be used in various ways. But for that, the, the, the European Union will have to, to learn how to walk quite fast. Will that lead to a German type growth model? No, the German type growth model cannot be uh, universalized because it relies on massive current account surpluses. Germany has eight, 9% uh, of GDP current account surpluses. Most of that is actually produced in Western Germany. So their current account surpluses would be even higher if you singled that out. You can't have that on the world scale because on the world scale, things have to even out. You can't even have politically. I mean, Europe has increased its current account surpluses from essentially zero 2008 to close to 3% now. Uh, neither Trump nor China is likely to let us go another from 3 to 6%. Uh, so th there really is a limit uh, externally in terms of your trade partners, how far you can go. Uh, but you can also not readily transplant uh, Germany's European structure onto other countries. Uh, therefore, the same fiscal policy would have very different effects. So uh, you, you can impose uniformity uh, in fiscal rules. It's not a very smart thing to do, but you can do that. But it will certainly not lead to uh, a German type growth model in other countries. OK. Uh, so we have uh, here, uh, is it, are you fine with the answer, Gonzalo? Are you? Yes, thank you. OK. Uh, we have a question coming from the YouTube. Uh, from someone asking about not uh, Europe, but China, actually, uh, which is your take uh, about uh, the growth regime pre and post 2008 crisis. More specifically, to what extent can we say that there was a shift in, in a, a regime, to, to what extent it became, to some sense, uh, more profit-led or has the person who's asking the question more pro-capital than it was uh, before? Um, to what extent uh, it became uh, more uh, wage-led or demand-led uh, economy growth? I don't know if you have something, something to say uh, on China. It's a bit uh, besides our discussion, but you You're probably not, have something to say. Fascinating and indeed important question. I'm not sure whether I have a good answer, but I can still give you a, a few thoughts. The first is, it, the, first the basics. The, the growth model literature is of course very Eurocentric. Right? It was developed having European countries in mind and the US uh, a similar uh, advanced economies. If you want to talk about developing countries, one probably would have to think more systematically about how you incorporate uh, supply-side factors. Now, part of it is what uh, we, we've discussed a few minutes ago, the question of core periphery structures and how countries try to address them. Uh, in the case of China or East Asia in particular, uh, more general, uh, I guess one should think of um, one should think of a concept of state-led growth. I mean, China has at various points uh, used uh, its, uh, its, its ownership 
uh, in the, uh, in particular, uh, the, the, the regional ownerships, uh, state-owned enterprises, it in various ways directs the economy, not least in terms of, of the financial sector and, and uh, the, the uh, capital movements. China is a very large economy and also a quite heterogeneous economy. I mean, essentially you have the, the typically the, the, the more coastal regions that are heavily industrialized. You have quite different regions uh, inland that, that are a lot poorer, a lot less developed. Um, so I would think that the first is that one would have to think a little bit about how uh, sort of you, you want to geographically disaggregate it and how you want to disaggregate or break it down over time. Now, Adam Tool certainly is making a very strong argument uh, that China, in response to the 2008 crisis, uh, engaged in a massive, essentially Keynesian uh, stimulus program. And I understand that in, in the, 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 the past two or three years, China has been very concerned about the extent its financial boom has taken and tried to stabilize things there. Uh, and in particular, try to stabilize asset prices once the, the, the Chinese government's perceived of them spinning out of control. So in other words, uh, I, I don't have a short answer on that. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, case study, I would not have thought that it has become more profit-led. I would also have thought it has become less export-oriented. The Chinese government, I think, has tried to, to balance towards domestic demand. Um, and I think part of that has also been that it has tried to strengthen uh, consumption demand. Uh, thus, if, if anything, I think it's uh, a state-led model uh, with some very export-oriented areas or provinces uh, and uh, some elements of, of wage land demand. Uh, but in the econometric exercises that we did a few years back, the, the book that I showed you, uh, China was identified with our analytical framework uh, as, as export, uh, sorry, it, um, as profit-led in the sense that uh, Chinese profit uh, exports were regarded as quite price sensitive. Uh, I, I'm not fully up to date on, on whether uh, since anyone has, has tried to update uh, that, but I, I think it, to some extent it has shifted to, to uh, a stronger state in terms of the growth contribution than uh, pre-crisis. Very good, thank you. Uh, we have now Jose Castro Caldas. I would ask you to turn off your video, turn on your video, Jose, if you may. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, this is actually a question uh, on one of your answers, not exactly your paper, but if you allow me, uh, I am curious about uh, your interpretation on current uh, events in the EU. Uh, the, question, the thing is, are we really witnessing the creation of a fiscal capacity in the EU, although a small fiscal capacity, a move in that direction? And uh, if I understand uh, correctly, this was, this was your interpretation. In that case, do you think that the creation of this uh, fiscal capacity will release um, the ECB from uh, its previous commitments on, uh, on uh, monet ex expansionary monetary, on acquisitions of uh, the sovereign obligations in the, in the market? Are we preparing for a, a withdrawal of the ECB following this uh, the creation of a, a, new, a new fiscal capacity. I'm, I'm asking that because I'm really concerned with that possibility and with the impact that would have on a, on a country like ours. Um, are we witnessing the birth of a European fiscal capacity? 
I certainly would hope so. Uh, and I cautiously would think so. Um, why do I say, I certainly hope. Uh, th that's simply because I think the situation is really dangerous. Uh, and we don't fully see how bad it is. Uh, I mean, I, I presume there's, there's uh, enough areas where you already see that it is quite bad. I mean, in terms of the increase in unemployment uh, and, and joblessness um, and the social hardship that comes with it. But essentially the order of magnitude of the recession that we will be facing obviously with quite a bit of variation across countries, will be somewhere in the order of magnitude of 5 to 15% of GDP, depending on how long we have to maintain the social distancing regime. But presumably that's not going away, to go away quickly. In other words, we are talking about GDP declines that are in order of magnitude, say, effect of two worse than the global financial crisis. We don't know how long lived. Uh, I would not be optimistic that this will, that the, the, the economic impact will be short lived. Uh, A, because it, it, the, it's essentially, it be, depends on the miracle vaccine to, to stop the virus. If that doesn't come, some form of social distancing has to stay in place. Thus, this drags on. However, we have now a quite large sector of the economy, and it's a, it, it, it hits particular sectors very hard, that essentially have depleted their cash reserves and are relying on government supported liquidity provision. In other words, from a mean scheme perspective, you have a massive increase of Ponzi finance. Yeah? This is an extremely unstable financial structure. So the, and, and these are units that's not gonna invest even if uh, uh, restrictions get loosened. So in other words, I, I see a very flat re recovery or, or stagnation coming out of that, even in, in the best scenarios. So in other words, the economic damage is massive. If the EU doesn't do something here, I mean, we've seen during the, the Euro crisis that the European Union and the Euro seems to be surprisingly robust against criticism. Uh, but sort of the, 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 the wave of social misery that could come if uh, the COVID crisis is not handled uh, uh, effectively, it, it, I think is, is still an order of magnitude higher than, than what we've seen. And thus the, the repercussions uh, on the EU may be stronger. In, in particular, the question is, uh, does Italy flip? Once Italy uh, either gets into a sovereign debt crisis or Eurosceptical elements there uh, get to government, we don't know what will happen. Um, on the other hand, it's also, I mean, it, it should be obvious to anyone that the COVID crisis is not anyone's fault. So it, all the, the, the moralism, the moral hazard arguments, the uh, sort of uh, criticism from Germany that uh, came in the Euro crisis shouldn't apply to the same extent. Uh, therefore, I would hope that there's some movement. Um, I do think that uh, the European Commission, I mean, the European, European Commission, of course, can't admit that it created one big mess in the Euro area, in the Euro crisis, despite the fact that this is the simple matter of fact. But I think they actually know that this didn't quite go according to plan, and certainly that it, uh, it was a lot worse than they had expected. So I would think that they are a bit more open-minded how far it will go, I do not know, but I, I would be cautiously optimistic. What does that mean for the ECB? Now, I would not expect the ECB to change uh, its policy in the short run. I certainly don't read any signals of Lagarde or the, the ECB in that direction. 
um, from what I understand is it's, it will rather step up its, its uh, operations. Um, I certainly agree with you that it would have an immediate and very dangerous impact on the Euro area if the ECB did stop its, its current uh, government uh, bond purchases. It would essentially create a, a, a second version of the Euro crisis. Why am I saying that? Well, governments now are more indebted than they were in 2010 or 2012. And I mean, they, they were already prior to COVID, but certainly with COVID they will be. So in other words, we'll routinely see government debts above whatever 120, 150% of GDP. If in that situation, and the euro area presently does not have a fiscal capacity. And however important, I think that first baby steps of Merkel and uh, Macron are, we are not talking of orders of magnitude to control any sovereign debt crisis. Yeah, it is really a, a, a symbolic gesture that the, the European Union also wants to engage in that dimension. It's not actually fixing any problem. It's just showing we, we, we at least want to move in that direction. Whereas the, the ECB is, is buying billions of government bonds every day. If they stopped it, I think it's, it's a matter of weeks until we are back in 2012. Uh, but I do think they are fully aware of that. And they are, thus they are also communicating uh, that this is what they will be doing. I think in that sense, the only danger, <laughs> if you want, is the, the German constitutional court. And, that battle is still open on, I mean, the German Constitutional Court has essentially told the ECB that it can't do what it's doing. The ECB will one way or another say, no, actually we can do that. But if that takes an unexpected turn, I think that the German Constitutional Court is really playing with fire here. I mean, in the current situation saying, why, does, why doesn't the ECB stop QE? I, I think that's, that's really sort of, spreading the gas in your house and, and uh, smoking a cigarette next to the gas. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jose. Um, we have uh, three questions from Zoom and one from uh, uh, YouTube. I would uh, give the, the floor to the people on Zoom first and then go through to the, the question by YouTube. Maybe if, you, if that's fine with you, Engelbert, I will ask the, all the three of them to make their questions in yep. a row, otherwise we might run out of time. Yep. So, Cristina, please, you go first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for this opportunity. Um, I have two questions. The first one has to do with non-price competitiveness um, and the, the role of diversification and sophistication uh, in economic growth. Um, the correlation that you present here in your paper between growth and, and ECI doesn't, um, doesn't reveal a very strong relationship. Were you surprised by that? That's, that's my, my first question. Um, and then uh, you ask to to what extent um, are the are the emerging post crisis growth models economically and politically viable? And you seem rather skeptical on the sustainability of these of these models. So my question would be, uh, how would it be the way then? Could it be something like the export driven uh, continental Europe model? having to stop squeezing wages so much um, on, one, on one hand or and for the other, for the debt dri driven models, would it imply that whenever you have the busts, uh, the state would kick in to restabilize uh, economic conditions? And, and in that situation, could we possibly envis envisage a situation where you have these cycles of boom and bust, but somehow the trend nevertheless is positive in, in the long run. These are my two questions, thank you. Actually, they sound quite elaborate, so maybe <laughs> it's better if you answer them, Engelbert, also because I suspect that the other two will not be directly related to these ones. No, so maybe we can do- questions, because I oh, okay. want to finish by, by it. 
Okay, okay. Go. So I will ask now uh, Alexandre. Hi. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Professor. Um, I was uh, reading the paper, which is a huge advancement in the literature of growth uh, regimes, and I was uh, wondering. Uh, I would I would like to ask you to what extent do you think um, personal income inequality and not only functional income inequality as many post Keynesians have put forward um, to what extent would it be interesting to be uh, to add as a new uh, important factor in determining these uh, growth regimes. Because now we have uh, top 1% shares for most advanced countries. And uh, I, I would uh, like to ask you, to what extent do you think it might really influence, uh, for example, this, the distinction between um, a, a demand-led regime or a debt-led uh, regime, given the different uh, marginal propensity to consume between top 1% and everybody else? Uh, uh, and the following question is, do you know if anyone uh, ever used uh, top 1% shares uh, or these distributional national accounts to in, in this type of literature? And finally, just a comment. I might be totally wrong, but I was really surprised when I saw uh, a f more than 50% decrease in nominal unit labor costs in Ireland. And I thought, uh, this might be due to the, the artificial growth of Ireland, which grew like 25% in, in 2015. So the 50% was in our papers or was somewhere, somewhere else? Yeah, in, our in this paper, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, very good. So Diogo, please go ahead. Yes, so uh, hello. Thank you for the opportunity to. Uh, it's a very quick question. So uh, I, I have some reserves regarding the, uh, it, it seems like the, some one of the implications of, of the paper is that uh, price competitiveness is not as important for growth, at least in the recovery time. But, uh, and the, the paper says, well, it was probably it was important for the, um, external balance, but it's not important for a growth regime. So we don't have like a export led growth regime in Southern Europe. Well, what I, what I think is that it, it remains important in the sense that uh, in Southern European countries, we cannot uh, do anything like an investment led strategy or a wage led strategy without having an external uh, binding external constraint that will uh, kind of create a, probably an uh, external debt crisis or something like that. So it, it, may, it might not be a, a static problem in the sense that now it's not related with the, our growth regime, but it's related with our potential of growth. Because if you want to uh, pursue some kind of uh, strategy for the future, external um, external balance and so price competitiveness is a problem. So my question is more like a perspective question in the sense that all the paper is around this kind of, you know, exogenous uh, shocks like autonomous demand shocks. I mean, it's not uh, explicitly, uh, explicitly addressed in the paper, but it has like various links with the autonomous demand um, literature, namely export demand, uh, conspicuous consumption, and, uh, and, and fiscal policy. And what can you do for the future? Because, I mean, wage-led policies, it's not, a, you know, a usable uh, strategy uh, currently, individually, in, in each European country, especially on the South. So, how do you address, and this is a very difficult question, how do you address a development strategy uh, for an individual country like Portugal in the European setting under this uh, political contest? Thank you. Thank you very much, Diogo. We have two final questions, Engelbert. I hope you can handle all this. Um, so it's, it, it comes from uh, Ricardo Dorsi uh, through YouTube. 
And the questions are, uh, first, are there any causal links between the two complementarity, complementary export-led and debt-led growth models? This is the first one. The second one is how does the growth model approach relate to the endogenous money view? Aren't the trade and financial links between alternative growth models an under-researched aspect? And this is it. So this was the final round of questions since we are approaching our uh, end. Yeah, uh, uh, that's enough questions for me. <laughs> I I'll suppose. start with the, with the inequality one. Um, yes, both I and various other people have played uh, with versions of uh, estimating demand regimes with personal income inequality in there. I was surprised that we didn't find more. Uh, I mean, the reason that we not published much in that direction, I mean, we have one paper where we control for it, but it's not very exciting what we find there. I was surprised how little we found there. That's, that's the short version of it. There's, there's some papers, uh, Reza and Cavallo have a paper where they argue that higher inequality makes profit-led demand regimes more likely, there's various papers that in particular link uh, uh, rising inequality uh, to conspicuous consumption and therefore uh, rising personal income inequality would sort of weaken that Kaletskian link that the poor uh, have a higher uh, uh, consumption propensity because everyone in a way is looking up to the next income a group and trying to copy their behavior. Uh, Till van Drake has papers like that. Uh, Capella and Schütz have a paper. There, there are several. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not too convinced by these, and I was surprised how little we found there, certainly in the consumption functions, where I would expect there to be more to find uh, is in terms of wealth distribution. Now, the flip side of the top 1% is that there, there is enormous concentration of wealth. And wealth, of course, is much more unequally distributed than income. If you give more wealth to the rich, those people will have different uh, financial investment strategies. Essentially, the working classes either save in saving accounts or in their houses, because that's the main assets that they're having. It's essentially the top 1% of the income distribution that is holding shares and uh, whatever, hedge funds and all the funny uh, financial instruments. So I would expect there to be a portfolio composition effect of wealth concentration that in the medium term does have substantial financial stability implications. Uh, as I said, there is a bit of research uh, and certainly quite a bit of theoretical modeling on incorporating personal income distribution uh, in uh, demand regime analysis, but my own reading of that is that the evidence of strong effects there is underwhelming. Um, There were several, okay, I'll next go to the, ah, sorry, the, um, the Irish unit labor costs. Uh, I'll have to check what we do there in the paper. Yes, the, the Irish GDP data are funny, uh, which is actually why in the paper we used uh, gross national income rather than uh, the gross national product, uh, because there you don't get the 20% GDP increases because Google decided to book its profits via Ireland, which literally seems to be what, what had happened. And those uh, GDP numbers, of course, do impact on the measured uh, wealth 
uh, the, the, the measured weight shares and possibly on the unit labor cost. But uh, I would have to check that, that particular number. Um, the price competitiveness, and isn't it important? Now, I don't want to come across as saying that price competitiveness doesn't matter. And indeed, in all the econometric exercises that I've been doing on estimating export equations or import equations, the price always plays a role. So my argument isn't, my argument is not that the partial effect is zero. The partial effect is certainly non-zero. Yeah? Um, and you will find that in, in essentially all the papers where, where I have estimated that. Now, there's a difference between a partial effect and a total effect. The argument is that, well, if you cut wages and you're more uh, export competitive, you may export more, but it may, it's likely to affect your domestic demand in the opposite direction. Therefore, I wouldn't expect the net effect of that exercise to be positive or at least very large. And I think that's by and large what, what the data are showing. So, the point is not that the price elasticities are negligible. They are there, uh, but in general, I think it's not a very wise strategy to try to simul stimulate growth via wage cut. I think in most circumstances, it will not work. Now you can argue if you're a small open economy like Portugal, you can play that for a while. And indeed we have various countries, the Netherlands uh, in the 1980s, uh, for example, uh, that played that for a while. You can do bigger thy neighbor policies via wage restraint if you're a small open economy. It certainly does not work if the European Union tells all the Southern European countries that they have to engage uh, in wage restraint because then you make sure that that policy is coordinated and that will just amplify the, the domestic demand effects. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I would defend uh, that uh, price competitiveness is overrated. It's most certainly overrated in the varieties of capitalism approach. Why? Well, the varieties of capitalism approach is essentially defining the viability of a variety of capitalism with respect to its ability to provide competitiveness. That makes sense if you're in a supply side world, because then you never have to worry about unemployment. You only have to worry about how you use your resources and whether you're efficient in competing with your neighbors. I don't think that's an approach that helps you understand uh, the actual growth dynamics. It doesn't help you understand the, 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 the effects uh, of, of internal devaluation in Southern Europe, but it also doesn't help you understand the booms that we had before the crisis in the Anglo-Saxon countries. So in other words, what I'm saying there is that the VOC is to a large extent barking up the wrong tree. Uh, it, it is solving problems that aren't problems. Now, there's a distinct question on whether we should worry about current accounts. Current accounts for a lot of countries, certainly for developing countries, uh, are a big problem or a big potential problem. So my point is not that you don't have to worry about current accounts. I would argue that if you had a proper Euro, uh, a, a committed European central bank and uh, a well-functional European uh, fiscal system, you wouldn't have to worry about uh, EU or Euro area internal current account imbalances. But in principle, of course, for all sorts of progressive economic policies, uh, current account imbalances have been and will be a problem. Uh, the question how you deal with that is A, aggregate demand management and B, uh, management of, of your capital account. Uh, in other words, if you're feeling that the economy is overheating, you wanna restrict capital inflows because that is typically what, what happens uh, if, if you're overheating, certainly from a developing country point of view, uh, counter-cyclical uh, capital management, as it's called nowadays, I think is vital. So my point wasn't that the current account doesn't matter. My point is that the importance of price competitiveness in a lot of these debates is overstated. And in uh, the case of VOC, for theoretical reasons. 
uh, was as a uh, the, our uh, non-price competitive measure actually had relative weak effects. Was I surprised by that? Um, medium. I actually wasn't too surprised. I was surprised how strong effects we found in the first place. Now, I have to admit, it wasn't my idea to apply those economic complexity measures to advanced economies, or the, in particular, uh, the, 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 the European countries. That's a concept that's coming out of uh, essentially de development debates, and it, it's essentially further development of of Latin American structuralism and um, in, in a, way, a way of thinking about how you can operationalize uh, the difference in economic structure that Prebish and the generation of structuralists were talking about. Uh, and for that, I think it's a very interesting one. I mean, it's not a, uh, sort of a silver bullet or the last word on it, but it's at least an interesting way of thinking about it. And the way they think about it is essentially how diversified are your inputs? How many other uh, uh, sectors do you need inputs from in order to produce what you're producing? That, in other words, how, how networked you are. And I think that that is an interesting approach. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I, I think our results are interesting. Uh, Jakob Capella and a group around him had a recent paper in the Cambridge Journal of Economics where they, they also use that indicator uh, and also find uh, strong effects. Uh, the other standard measure is essentially around the, the, the price elasticity or price sensitivity of exports in, in different sectors. Um, that has its own problems of measurement and identification. That's why I like the, uh, the complexity index. Uh, the viability of those post-crisis growth models, the short answer is I'm, I'm not convinced at all that they are very stable, which has conceptual challenges uh, for how we think about growth models. Because no? we tend to think of growth models certainly coming from the VOC direction, but also as post-Keynesians, we think of them being at least reasonably durable. Um, so, so for, for logical coherence, we want them to be long-lived. I think in the current circumstances, we should expect quite short-lived growth configurations. One obvious one is the attempt of the European Union to, uh, of doing internal devaluation and thereby create export-led growth. A, it doesn't generate export-led growth, it, it just, I mean, it creates exports, but it doesn't create much growth. Uh, but B, it does succeed in creating and amplifying international trade imbalances. And that, I think, is a question of time until that will lead to follow up problems, until Trump retaliates, uh, China gets upset, or what have you. Huh? So I do think that's, that's unstable. Um, it, it's the other form of instability that you have pointed out is uh, what the U.S. is doing. The U.S. Uh, the U.S. had a more Keynesian reaction, uh, at, at least initially, in in some ways than uh, uh, European countries in reaction to the crisis. Part of that is possibly just that they have a weaker welfare states and thus automatic stabilizers are weaker. But the U.S. have a, a, a stronger Keynesian tradition in some ways. Uh, so what you have in a way is a a, a version of a banker's Keynesianism, no? not the post-Keynesianism or the Kalecki and post-Keynesianism where I'm coming from, but it's essentially an a, a anti-cyclical fiscal policy that is combined with bank bailouts. Uh, and to some extent, that is increasingly accepted uh, by the international financial community and in particular by the, by the relevant American policymakers. Now, if you think uh, that's again in the tools book if, if you want to have a nice discussion. If you think of the uh, of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve's, uh, the American Central Bank's reaction to the international dollar shortage uh, uh, in the, at the outbreak of the financial, global financial crisis 2008. Essentially, they established massive 
multilateral dollar swap agreements. In other words, the Fed very explicitly recognizes that it is playing the land of last resort to other central banks. That's certainly not what the American constitution says or what American law says that the, the Federal Reserve has to do. Uh, the, the world economy needs that, so it's not a bad idea if they do that, and they're doing it, and they are quite aware of it. They don't necessarily advertise it because they realize that it will create political problems. So it, th th there is an element of management in there, and the IMF, uh, a few years after the crisis, had these, um, these studies that says, well, we have probably around 200 systemically important international banks. And we essentially know that they can't go bust. I mean, that's just too dangerous. Since Lehman, we, we know that this is too dangerous. So in other words, th th there are elements in the policy community that accept that for some big players, the general rules of capitalism that you can go bankrupt if you create a mess don't apply. And the IMF also put a price tag on that on how much those banks are saving in terms of the interest spreads that they're getting. And the orders of magnitudes that you get there are enormous. I mean, you're getting more money than, than you get uh, uh, development aid. Uh, so I do think that, it, that there is a chance that this is becoming a, a particular form of a, of, a, of a financial cycle where the state periodically steps in to sort out the mess. Now, Greenspan, by the way, always told you that. He told you that you shouldn't interfere with the market, except for if there's a mess you help to, to, to put the floor onto the problems that you have. In other words, it's not like the 1930s where you wanna, you, you're happy that the rotten fruits are, are getting picked out. No, you, you stabilize them. Uh, it can work for a while, but it would only work for the US, I presume. I don't see the institutions otherwise that it would work. So it, in other words, these are quite conflictive uh, and, and uh, unstable creatures of, of uh, growth models that we have in the, in the post-crisis period. Um, causal links between export-led and debt uh, late economies, uh, and how do they link to endogenous money creation? That's actually a difficult one. Now, the standard story, one that I presume initially uh, is uh, was told was well, the the debt late economies are. Uh, uh, having the imports does provide the counterposition uh, to the export leads. Thus, you get a complementarity in terms of, of the trade flows. In other words, the, the export led economies need to some extent uh, the partners that, that are running trade deficits and, and therefore having the counterposition. That's certainly true. The more interesting one, certainly from a Minskian point of view, is on the financial side. Now, if you think of those current account positions is not primarily due to, uh, uh, the, 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 or causally due to the trade side, meaning it's not cost differences that cause current account imbalances. But if you think of current account imbalances as the side effect of lending decisions and in particular international capital flows, uh, then you don't necessarily have the same complementarity because in principle, uh, if you have a property boom in Spain, you could generate the credit internally. And indeed, once you take such a financial look at the current account imbalances, you quickly notice several odd things. Claudio Borio's work at the BIS is very interesting. Yeah? So Claudio Borio is noticing Noting that if you think of the, of, uh, the countries that lent uh, to the Southern European countries, actually that was not necessarily countries that had large current account surpluses. In particular, Britain lent a lot because it's a financial sector, uh, sorry, a financial center, 
uh, despite the fact that Britain at the time had current account deficits. So it, 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 it's not that you need current account surpluses before you can lend. Uh, and France, which at the time had relatively balanced current accounts in, in terms of trade, uh, also uh, uh, was holding a lot of uh, uh, foreign assets in, in Southern Europe. So in other words, the financial flows are quite different from the trade flows. Um, and that might complicate the, 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 the issue of the complementarity between the debt-led and the export-led uh, uh, countries. Now, that wasn't necessarily a very good point to conclude, uh, but I think with that, I have worked myself to the questions uh, and thank the audience for the discussion and the interesting questions. Thank you, Engelbert. This was uh, certainly a very rich session, a rich uh, period of questions and answers. I would like to thank you once, once more, uh, Engelbert, for, for being with us uh, today and uh, say it again that we, we really hope to have you actually with us, <laughs> not uh, uh, with us, but away uh, sooner. Um, then later we hope to have you here in Lisbon, somewhere in Portugal, to have a, a more um, to continue this discussion. I think it was a very useful session. Uh, thank you very much for your pedag pedagogical effort as well for those that uh, are not acquainted with uh, with these matters. And I would like to thank all the audience, in particular the PhD students and PhD faculty, for being present and for for the questions that uh, were posed. And uh, we will meet again soon in another one of these uh, web seminars on political economy. Thank you all and uh, see you soon. Thanks. Bye.